right side, far right side should show a little battery or a plug. Then if you put your mouse over the top of that, it should say battery status, charging, fully charged. Whatever. Oh, well, we'll see what happens. Like I said, if we go dead, we go, you'll know what happened to me. <laughs> Last four hours. Yeah. Might have to exit full screen to see her little battery icon. Okay. Um, as soon as it gets on Roku, we're ready. Okay. Who's Sabbath school teacher today? Ed and Linda? Okay. And oops. okay, we're ready. Okay. And good morning and happy Sabbath to everybody watching. Amen. And uh, before we start this presentation, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us, this Sabbath day. It's a beautiful day, and uh, we're here at least virtually with uh, friends and fellows uh, and sisters in Christ, and this is marvelous. Father, I pray that you guide us, that you guide our, hear, our ears and our thinking, and that uh, we can understand what you might have for us today, and we can apply to our lives and our understanding. We praise you, Lord, and give thanks for all things good from your hand. In the name of our Lord, our Savior, your precious only begotten Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, the name of this presentation is Mothers and Daughters of Babylon. And when we look in the Bible, we see that the Bible contains several instances of wicked mothers and their equally wicked daughters. So it must mean something. <laughs> what is the typology of these pairs? And what can God's people learn from their stories? So the first one we're going to consider today is the pair Jezebel and Athaliah. And we all know who Jezebel is, but Athaliah is a little less well-known than her mother Jezebel. But let's look and see. And so would someone please begin reading? And in the 30 and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and two years. And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebath, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethabel, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So we're told by the spirit of prophecy uh, that the influence of Jezebel and idolatry over Ahab had more power over him than the influence of the spirit of God. And um, this is because Ahab made idolatry his choice. I mean, he was totally bewitched by, by uh, Jezebel. Okay, continue. Through the influence of Jezebel and her imp impious priests, the people were taught that the idol gods that had been yet had been set up were deities ruling by their mystic power the elements of earth fire and water all the 
all the bounties of heaven, the running brooks, the streams of living water, the gentle dew, the showers of rain, which refresh the earth and cause the fields of, to bring forth abundantly were inscribed to the favor of Baal and Asherah instead of to the giver of every good and perfect gift. The people forgot that the hills and valleys, the streams and fountains were in the hand of the living God, that he controlled the sun, the clouds of heaven, and all the powers of nature. Bel was considered the son of El, um, E-L that's spelled, uh, which was their supreme god. And Asherah was the female goddess of the sea. Bel was considered god of many powers, including the sun, and is associated with Nimrod and sun worship as well. So it's very convoluted. Idolatry is very convoluted. All the relationships of all the various deities. Continue. Jezebel imported prophets of Baal and Azeroth to Israel, 850 in number. These are subsidized and supported. That's from uh, Mount Carmel, then uh, Kingdom of Israel. Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Yeah, so the whole point of this is to show that um, Jezebel had imported all these prophets to Israel, and they, they infested Israel with idolatry. And the groves were actually planted and pagan altars erected for human sacrifice, as we all know, and other horrible practices, unmentionable things that they did. Captivated by the gorgeous display and the fascinating rites of idol worship, the people followed the example of the king and his court and gave themselves up to the intoxicating, degrading pleasures of a sensual worship. In their blind folly, they chose to reject God and his worship. The light so graciously given them had become darkness. The fine gold had become dim. Alas, how had the glory of, or how, yes, alas, how had the glory of Israel departed? Never before had the chosen people of God fallen so low in apostasy. Of the prophets of Baal, there were 450 besides 400 prophets of the groves. Jezebel also slew the true prophets of God after Elijah had declared the punishment of God by drought. Was, not, was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water? So the true prophets of the Lord, um, they were in big danger when Jezebel was around because she was on a murderous rampage to get rid of them. All this evidence of God's justice and judgments does not awaken Israel to repentance. Jezebel is filled with insane madness. She will not bend nor yield to God, to the God of heaven. Bell's prophet, Ahab, Jezebel and nearly the whole of Israel charged their calmly upon Elijah. Ahab has sent to every kingdom and nation in search of strange prophet and has required an oath of the kingdoms and nations of Israel that they know nothing in regard to him. Elijah had locked heaven with his word and had taken the key with him and he could not be found. Jezebel then decides that as she cannot make Elijah feel her murderous power, she will be revenged by destroying the prophets of God in Israel. No one was professed to be a prophet of God shall live. This determined and frustrated woman executes her work of madness by slaying the Lord's prophets. Baal's priests and all Israel are so far deluded 
that they think that if the prophets of God were slain, the calamity under which they are suffering would be averted. Elijah then defeated and slaughtered the prophets of Baal at the showdown on Mount Carmel. Jezebel was thrown into a murderous, murderous rage. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So it's interesting that uh, the curse that Jezebel swore on herself would actually come to pass later on, as we know. Okay, continue, please. As Ahab told the queen of the slaying of the idolatrous prophets, Jezebel, hardened and impenitent, became infuriated. She refused to recognize in the events on Carmel, the overruling providence of God, and instilled defiance. She boldly declared that Elijah should die. <laughs> the despicable Jezebel also murdered Naboth for his vineyard, simply because Ahab coveted the same. The vineyard, according to God's law, was the rightful inheritance of the family of Naboth. Nevertheless, Ahab, acting as a spoiled, pouting child, desired what was not his. And we know that from the scripture in Numbers, Numbers 36, 7 says, So shall not the inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe, for every one of the children of Israel shall keep himself to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. So what Ahab coveted was not his to covet. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Je Jezreelite. So consider the arrogance of Jezebel in this statement, who will give the uh, vineyard to Ahab. It was not hers to give. Um, it was not hers to give what God said could not be given, and yet she did anyway. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king. And then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. And as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. Jezebel thus influenced her husband, King Ahab, to do evil. The evil influence that Jezebel had exercised from the first over Ahab continued during the later years of his life and bore fruit in deeds of shame and violence, such as have seldom been equaled in sacred history. There was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord when Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. So I think we have established pretty well the wickedness of Jezebel. But what of Athaliah, her daughter? Let's see about her. The union of Ahab and Jezebel produced at least three offspring, including sons, King Azariah and King Jerohim of Israel, and daughter Athaliah. Even though some scholars disagree, the spirit of prophecy tells us that Athaliah was indeed the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. 
Athaliah of the house of Israel married another Jeroboam, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. This again was a marriage of political expectancy, which attempted to straighten the bonds between the often worn split king kingdom. This marriage was a stain on Jehoshaphat as an otherwise godly king of Judah. Some years after coming to the throne, Jehoshaphat, now in the height of his prosperity, consented to the marriage of his son and heir Jeroboam to Athaliah, daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. By this union there was formed between the kingdoms of Judah and Israel an alliance which was not in the order of God and which in a time of crisis brought disaster to the king and to many of his subjects. So this little um, family tree just shows what we just read, and it shows it, it's a little easier to understand. The kingdom was split, remember, at that time between Israel and, and Judah and the line of David. And um, Ahab over here in Israel was the king of Israel, the son of Omri, and he married Jezebel, and they had these, at least these three children. And we also know that Ahab had more by his concubines and other wives. But by Jezebel, he had Ahaziah, Jehoram, and Athaliah, a daughter. And so he married off his daughter Athaliah to another Jehoram, who was the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And it's confusing, but if you look at this, you can see how that worked. It was a marriage of um, political expediency, obviously. And Athaliah, the daughter who married this Jehoram, uh, son of Jehoshaphat, um, produced a son, Ahaziah. And um, he was also killed by Jehu. And his son, Jehoash, was hidden by his nurse and we've all read that story um in in the book of kings but it becomes very confusing and it's always confused me but um you can just see that the evil that jezebel perpetrated in israel would then have an avenue to come to judah that she introduced as well the idolatry and the bell worship and all that stuff she bought it with her and so it infected Judah as well. And that's what that statement means that um, Jehoshaphat, who was a very godly king in Judah, it was a stain on him really to allow his son to marry this daughter of Jezebel. But it happened that way. And we'll see the result. Hmm. Athaliah possessed the same wicked and murderous spirit as her mother Jezebel. When Jehu slew the house of Ahab in Israel, he also slew Azariah, king of Judah, the son of Athaliah. This wicked woman then schemed to usurp the throne of Judah by killing all the male heirs to the throne, her own grandsons. And when Athaliah, the mother of Azariah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King John, sister of Azahiah, took Joash, the son of Azahiah, and stole him among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her, hid in the house of, of the Lord six years, and Athaliah did reign over the land. So this wicked woman then usurped the, um, the throne of Judah for this time. Tidings of this general execution by Jehu of the house of Ahab reached Athaliah, Jezebel's daughter, who still occupied a commanding position in the kingdom of Judah. When she saw that her son, the king of Judah, was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. In this massacre, all the descendants of David who were eligible to the throne were destroyed, save one, a babe named Joash, whom the wife of Jehora, the high priest, hid within the precincts of the temple. For six years, the child remained hidden while Athaliah reigned over the land. Okay. 
Not the least of Athaliah's sins was the promotion and continuation of the iniquitous Baal worship, which now spread from Israel to Judah. Athaliah reigned for six years as the only ruling queen of either Judah or Israel. The Bible says little of Athaliah's reign, but it was but it is clear that she followed her husband. Jerome's policy of tolerating both the worship of Yahweh and of Baal. A temple of Baal existed in Jerusalem during her time, but it is not clear whether it was built before her reign or during it. This wicked mother-daughter pair also died the way they lived. Jezebel was killed when Jehu, the man commissioned with destroying the house of Ahab, <coughs> had her thrown from the window at the top of the wall. Her body was consumed by dogs. Athaliah also died violently when Joash was rightly restored as king by Jehodia, the high priest. So let's read next how Athaliah died. Um, in the course of time, the true King Joash was revealed, as the Bible tells us, to the people, and Athaliah was destroyed. And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. And when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manor was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king. And all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. And Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, treason, treason. But Je Jehoiada, the priest, commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the host, and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges, and him that followeth her kill with the sword. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. And they laid hands on her, and she went by the way by the which the horses came into the king's house, and there was she slain. So that was the end of Jezebel and Athaliah. That's how they both died. The Jezebel Athaliah pair are the wicked mother daughter pair of the Old Testament. But what about the New Testament? A pair just as evil are found there also in the person of Herodias and her daughter. The Bible does not call this daughter by name, but we are told by just. Josephus, her name was Salome. Salome. Flourished first century. According to the Jewish historian, Josephus, the daughter of Herodias and stepdaughter of Herod and Antipas, Tetris, ruled appointed by Rome of Galilee, a region in Palestine. Who are Herodias and Salome? Herodias is introduced in the Bible as the wife of Herod Antipas, who is Tetrarch of Galilee. He was the brother of Herod Philip, who was Tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis. Herodias was originally married to Philip, but divorced him for Antipas, who also divorced his spouse for her. Herodias had a daughter by this previous marriage named Salome. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus <laughs> and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. 
And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Historians assume that the reason why Herodias married Herod, Antipas was for ambitious reasons. Her ex-husband was supposed to be the heir of Herod the Great, but he could quickly fell out of favor. Herod Antipas was the ruler of Galilee and Perea, whereas Herod without land and Philip was lazy and had no political ambition or power. The marriage between Herod Antipas and Herodias caused outrage among the people who saw it as a violation of the Jewish law because it was forbidden for a man to marry his brother's divorced wife. John the Baptist was the leader of the opposition, and Antipas had him in prison. So once again, um, as with Jezebel, we now see how this wicked woman um, is just filled with immorality and lawlessness. And she also has a daughter. Okay, but when her... Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed by her mother, said, give me here John ba Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them that sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given, and he sent and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel. And she brought it to her mother, and his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Herodias knew that by direct measure, she could never win Herod's consent to the death of John. And she resolved to accomplish her purpose by stratagem. On the king's birthday, an entertainment was to be given to the officers of state and the nobles of the court. There would be fast uh, feasting and drunkenness. <coughs> Herod would thus be thrown off his guard and might then be influenced according to her will. The head of John the Baptist was carried to Herodias, who received it with piteous satisfaction. She exulted in her revenge and flattered herself that Herod's conscience would no longer be trouble, but no happiness resulted to her from her sin. <coughs> her name became notorious and abhorred, while Herod was more tormented by remorse than he had been given the warnings of the prophet. The influence of John's teachings was not silence. It was to extend to every generation till the close of time. Herodias's political ambition ultimately led to her end. During her marriage to Herod Antipas, Herodias was deeply involved in politics and was a major force during Harold Antipas's reign and rivalries, especially with her brother, Herod Agrippa. When Emperor Caligula made Herod Ant Agrippa king in 37 AD, Herodias was humiliated at her brother's elevation. In 39 BC, she persuaded her husband to go to Rome to seek the same title himself. However, when Herod Antipas arrived in Rome, the emperor believing in Herod Agrippa's slanders about Herod Antipas banished him to Lugdunium, modern day lions in Gaul. Herod Antipas also had to give all his of his fortune to Herod Agrippa. Emperor Caligula uh, permitted Herodias <laughs> to stay in Galilee. However, Herodias chose to go with her husband to exile. She died sometime after 40 AD. 
that's a typo, by the way, that should say 39 AD, not 39 BC. So um, we see that all of the political manipulations and desire for power only led to exile and death for Herodias, as well as Herod Antipas. Salome, the daughter of Herodias, is not guiltless. She purposefully danced in a way to appeal to the lust of Herod, and it was at last her request that sealed the doom of John the Baptist. The king was dazed with wine. Passion held sway and reason was dethroned. He saw only the hall of pleasure with its revealing guests, with its reveling guests, the banquet table, the sparkling wine, and the flashing lights, and the young girl dancing before him. In the recklessness of the moment, he desired to make some display that would exalt him before the great men of his realm. With an oath, he promised to give the daughter of Herodias whatever she might ask even to the half of his kingdom. Salome hastened to her mother to know what she should ask. The answer was ready, the head of John the Baptist. Salome knew not of the thirst for revenge in her mother's heart, and she shrank from the, presenting the request, but the determination of Herodias prevailed. The girl returned with the terrible petition, I will that thou forthwith give me in a charger the head of John the Baptist. So there are some interesting parallels between Jezebel and Herodias. Um, when you think about it, both were queens in Israel, but both were of mixed uh, ethnicity. They weren't pure Hebrew, neither one of them. Uh, both possessed wicked, sinful characters, obviously, and both instigated the murder of a righteous man <laughs> by trickery. Um, did not Jezebel do that with Naboth? And Herodias did that with John the Baptist. Um, both of these women dominated their weak and vacillating husband kings. Um, both of their husband kings had moments of sorrow and repentance for the evil acts they committed at their wives' instigation. We can read about those in those scriptures there I listed. Um, both uh, were rebuked by God's righteous prophets, Elijah and uh, John the Baptist in the case of Herodias. And they both had wicked daughters. That's what's really striking. They both did. And they both, Jezebel and Herodias, succumbed to shameful deaths. So that I just found that interesting. Why are the stories of these evil mother-daughter pairs presented in the Bible? And um, when we were Putting this together, we thought they seem to foreshadow another entity found in the New Testament. And someone want to read? Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels who had the seven vials and talked <laughs> to me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of, abom of abominations and filthy of her fornications. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and, abom and abominations of the earth. So if she's the mother of harlots, um, she definitely has vile and pure daughters as well, and they're harlots as well. Continue, please. The woman Babylon of Revelation 17 is described as arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. As the <laughs> prophet, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. 
Babylon is further declared to be that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth, the power that for so many centuries maintained despotic sway over the monarchs of Christendom is Rome. Purple and scarlet color, the gold and precious stones and pearls, vividly picture the magnificence and more than kingly pomp affected by the haughty sea of Rome. No other power could be so truly declared drunken with the blood of the saints as that church which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Christ. Babylon is also charged with the sin of unlawful connection with the kings of the earth. It was by departure from the Lord and the alliance with the heathen that the Jewish church became a harlot, and Rome, corrupting herself in like manner by seeking the support of worldly powers, receives a like condemnation. Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. The message of Revelation 14 announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to religious bodies that were once pure and have become corrupt. Since this message follows the warning of the judgment, it must be given in the last days. Therefore, it cannot refer to the Romish church, for that church has been in a fallen condition for many centuries. Furthermore, in the 18th chapter of Revelation, in a message which is yet future, <coughs> excuse me, the people of God are called upon <coughs> to come out of Babylon. According to this scripture, many of God's people must still be in Babylon. And what religious bodies are the greater part of the followers of Christ now to be found without doubt in the various churches professing the pro Protestant faith? So she's telling us that the apostate Protestant churches are the daughters of Rome. Anybody? At the time of their rise, these churches took a noble stand for God and the truth, and his blessing was with them. Even the unbelieving world was constrained to acknowledge the benefits, the beneficent results that followed in acceptance of the principles of the gospel. In the words of the prophet to Israel, thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through thy comely, through my comelylessness which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. But they fell, uh, they fell by the same desire, which was the curse and ruin of Israel, the desire of imitating the practices and courting the friendship of the ungodly. Thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played this, the harlot because of thy renown. Many of the Protestant churches are following Rome's example of iniquitous connection with the kings of the earth, the state churches, by the relation to secular governments and other denominations by seeking the favor of the world. <coughs> the term Babylon, confusion, may be appropriately applied to these bodies, all professing to derive their doctrines from the Bible, yet divide it into almost innumerable sects with widely conflicting creeds and theories. I'll read this one. The picture of the wicked mother and daughter is also shown in Revelation 2, where even the name of Jezebel is invoked. And we're familiar with this, this scripture. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, 
and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. <coughs> Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto thee, unto every one of you, according to your works." And so there is another picture of a mother and offspring. It's, it's, it's subtle, but it's there. So it would appear that as Jezebel sponsored the worship of Baal in Israel, so in John's day, some false prophetess was attempting to lead astray the church of Thyatira. The message indicates that here, even more than at Pergamum, apostasy was openly and defiantly rampant. And as applied to the Thyatira period of Christian history, the figure of Jezebel represents the power that produced the great apostasy of the medieval centuries. So once again, we're seeing the great, um, the harlot um, being Rome, and um, she has daughters, obviously, today as well. So then in the stories of the wicked mother-daughter pairs, Jezebel, Athaliah, and Herodias Salome, we see foreshadowed the mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, and her daughters, the fallen apostate churches who follow her. So what do we do with this? The Bible, the Bible charts our only course of safety. And this is what it is. It's in Revelation 18, 1 through 5, and these are familiar scriptures, but we have to heed them. It says, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and it is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. And that is for us today. We need to come out of come out of Babylon. And let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that your word in many different ways warns us of danger and provides a safe course for our lives. Thank you for showing us Babylon and her daughters and how to avoid apostasy. Keep us safe in the faith always, Lord, we pray. And we offer this to you in the name of your only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That was good. Very interesting, fascinating. Yeah, you don't see many people naming the their Bible. daughters uh, Jezebel and Herodias today. <laughs> no, no, that's for sure. No, they had like they had a lot of prophets. Yeah, like, false prophet. But you know that that's one of the things that my mom, which I didn't heed, she says when you get married, you're going to marry a woman, girl. If you want to know what she's like, find out what her mother is like. And that's a good example of that today. Oh, actually, I'm kind of glad that uh, 
I didn't find out what Linda's mom was like. <laughs> Not that there's anything really bad there, but uh, 